And if you still think you can stop us, don't forget, I'm invincible. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in Season 2, Episode 1 of... Man, this episode was so sick. One of my favorite things about this series is the meta references to the superhero genre itself. So I was very excited to see season two will be inspired by Kang the Conqueror and Marvel's Multiverse Saga, but more on all that in just a bit. First, let's do a quick refresher. And by the way, we also have a great recap of season one up on the channel right now, so be sure to check that out. Now, in the first season, we meet Mark Grayson, the son of Nolan Grayson, AKA Omni-Man. Now, Omni-Man is a lot like Superman when it comes to power set and alien status. He comes from a planet called Viltrum. Now, the Viltrum all share these godlike powers and use them to conquer planets throughout the galaxy. So when Mark, who is half Viltrumite, comes into his powers, he becomes the superhero Invincible. And shortly thereafter, he learned about his father's true purpose on Earth. It's time for you to know where I really come from. Invincible and Omni-Man, father and son, have a massive battle in Chicago, and Omni-Man nearly beats his kid to death. Before laying a final death blow into his son, Omni-Man decides to spare his life and leaves Earth. Now then season two opens in what we soon learn is an alternate dimension, a dimension where Invincible joined his father in his mission to take over the planet. We see Invincible fight an immortal, a member of the superhero team, the Guardians of the Globe. In season one, we saw Omni-Man murder Immortal, but he's later resurrected, hence the name. Now in this fight, Invincible says, I've been hit harder before. Like, way harder. Suggesting that in this alternate dimension, Invincible and his father still had a giant fight, but Invincible eventually decided to join him. He says as much here. Look, I didn't get it at first either, but I came around and you will come around too. This apocalyptic future with resistance fighters hiding underground reminded us a lot of the grim future of X-Men Days of the Future Past. Invincible and Omni-Man track down their realities, Guardians of the Globe, and kill them. Well, most of them, but more on that in just a bit. Now, seeing Omni-Man kill the Guardians in the first episode of Season 2 parallels how he killed them in the first episode of Season 1. Now, in this alternate dimension, we can see classic mushy Rudy the Robot. In this universe, he did not clone his consciousness into a clone body of Rexplode, unlike in Season 1, like in the main universe. Universe. Speaking of Rex, this line from Eve suggests that in this universe, he's dead. The immortal let them away. We're safe. Yeah, that's what Rex thought too. And next we get to the cruel realization that this universe's Mark has truly become just like his father. I'm not gonna call him dad. Killing Eve would already be terrible, but what's even worse is that he paralyzes her so that he can visit, treating her like his pet, just how Nolan treated his wife as a pet. She's more like a, a pet. Me. Now, in this episode, we meet Angstrom Levy, aka Evil Doer in the Invincible comics. In the comics, Angstrom has the ability to travel the multiverse via portals. Like many characters in Invincible, he is inspired by another comic character, Kang the Conqueror. We've done it before. Now, in this alternate dimension, we see this Angstrom serving as a member of the Resistance. And right as he's about to be killed by Invincible, he is portaled away by his variant self. What the hell was that? Now, back in the main universe, a month after the events of the season finale, we see Invincible living that superhero life. One of my favorite heroics we see him do is his creation of a tidal wave to stop a fire. Now, we also enjoyed the attention to detail in seeing Invincible hold back rage, striving to not be like his father, unlike in the first 17 years of his life when he wanted nothing more than to be exactly like his dad. I want to be just like you. Now, here we can see a giant elephant guy, which is meant to be a parody of Spider-Man's Rhino. <laughs> And notice how during this montage, Mark continues to see flashes of his fight with his dad, including the building that his father collapsed, killing dozens of people. When Mark arrives back home, we can see that he has finally mastered landing, something that he had a lot of trouble with in episode one of the first season. And here we can see a reporter in Chicago in the Chiron Leeds Life After Omni-Man. See, this brutal destruction of Chicago parallels the Battle of Metropolis and Man of Steel, as well as the Battle of New York in the Avengers. This is an apocalyptic, world-changing event that forever changes the way normal people will see superheroes. Now, across the street from Mark's house, we can see this crater taped off, a callback to this scene from season one. Now, in the comics and in the show, the cover story was that there was a gas leak explosion across the street, and that is what killed Nolan, aka, like, Omni-Man's real name. The Maulers are the super strong and super smart set of villainous twins, and one of them is a clone. But part of their pact is that neither of them knows which is the original and which is the clone. The Maulers are voiced by Kevin Michael Richardson, who has also voiced characters like Groot, <laughs> Kilowog. Kind of figured you'd turn up here, hotshot. Bishop. How about we grab your machine and get out of here? And Trigon. I am your creator. 
your master. So Angstrom breaks the Maulers out of prison via Portal, except this is a different Angstrom, the Angstrom that portaled this one away at the start of the episode. Angstrom explains his multiversal power sets and explains to the Maulers his not-so-evil plan. <laughs> So when Mark arrives at school, everyone is staring at him because they all heard that his dad died in the Battle of Chicago. Not as Omni-Man, but clearly as a civilian casualty. We then see Mark's old bully, Todd, give Mark a hug and tell him that he's sorry about his dad. And this scene reminded us a lot of The Amazing Spider-Man when Flash Thompson tries to comfort Peter after hearing his Uncle Ben died. Your uncle died. I'm sorry. In this conversation with Amber, we hear her tell Mark that he doesn't owe anyone anything, to which Mark says, I'm not so sure. So this shows that after his father's betrayal of the entire planet, Mark feels that he owes it to the people of Earth to use his powers to protect them. Like Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Doug, did you say you had an Easter egg you wanted to mention here? Oh yeah, see I noticed this restaurant is called BM and it has smell squiggles above the logo, which, which basically makes it look like it, it's, it's called a smelly BM. That is a great observation, buddy. High five. Okay, so at the Smelly BM Diner, Mark is meeting with Cecil, and Cecil is in charge of the Global Defense Agency. So the GDA is a secret government agency that oversees superhero affairs and, well, global defense. In the first season, Cecil pieced it together pretty quickly that it was Omni-Man who massacred the Guardians of the Globe. Nolan killed the Guardians of the Globe. I know. Now in this meeting, Mark expresses to Cecil that he wants back in. He wants to be sent on a mission and wants his powers to be put to use to help the world. I need to do more. Now Cecil is understandably hesitant to throw Mark back into the ring because of the reveal of his father's real motives. Mark is half Viltrumite, so like Cecil's not 100% sure where his loyalty lies. He is understandably nervous to put his faith back into a being like Invincible after what went down with Omni-Man. I'm not making the same mistake I made with Nolan. There's only one way this kid goes back out there and that's on a very short leash. Next, we get to see the new Guardians of the Globe in action. Now, this new team consists of Rexplode, Duplicate, Monster Girl, Shrinking Ray, Black Samson, and Robot. It was very cool to see Robot's body return, but it's no longer remote-controlled suit. Rudy is actually inside, kind of like Iron Man. Now you're here, in person. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Rudy, with the help of the Mahler twins, cloned his consciousness into a cloned, younger body of Rexplode. And so now, instead of fighting remotely, he's actually on the battleground. I just want to give a shout-out to all these voice actors who you've heard before, but you may not realize that. Now, Greg Griffin is a voice actress who provided the voices for Shrinking Ray, Monster Girl, Olga, Adam Eve's adoptive mother, and various other Invincible characters. She's also provided the voice for Scooby-Doo's Daphne Blake, Black Cat, and Wonder Woman. You will never rise from the ashes of your shame and humiliation. And of course, Mark is voiced by Steven Yeun, who is famous for playing Glenn on The Walking Dead. And we can also hear Carrie Payton, another Walking Dead alum, voicing Black Samson. Now, Carrie played King Ezekiel in The Walking Dead TV series and has also voiced Cyborg in The Teen Titans. I don't need you to make me a man. I already am one. Next, we meet what Angstrom refers to as The Family. Now, this is a clear parody of not only Marvel's Council of Kangs, but also Marvel's Council of Reeds as well. Angstrom has assembled thousands of his variant selves from across the multiverse. He reveals that the others don't have his multiversal portal powers, but they all have crucial knowledge about their dimensions that he wants transferred into his single mind. As only someone who can see the whole puzzle can put it together. Now, again, to show that he's a parallel to Kang, Kang believes that, like he is the smartest, he is the most almighty. It's very egotistical of Angstrom to say, well, I need all the knowledge inside of my brain. So even in this point, even though his like motives are heroic, we can see the seeds of him becoming a villain. So in this room of Angstrom's, we can also see the variants from the beginning of the episode that was portaled away before being killed by Invincible. Next, we see Debbie, Nolan's wife, talking with Olga about everything that's happened. Now, Olga was the wife of the now deceased Red Rush, a member of the Guardians of the Globe who was killed by Omni-Man. You were hurt as badly as I was. Both our husbands died that night. Olga was actually the person who aroused Debbie's suspicions about the Omni-Man cover story, saying, They know who did this and they don't care. So since Olga's suspicions turned out to be right, her and Debbie had become closer. And here we get another callback to when Nolan called Debbie his pet. Said I didn't matter, that I was a pet. She's more like a, a pet. Me. So Olga says to Debbie that she doesn't need to worry because Omni-Man is gone, and now she, like the rest of the world, basically thinks Omni-Man is dead. Now Debbie doesn't have superpowers, but she's got a really interesting arc at this point in the show. Just like in the comic, she's depressed, she's drinking too much, and she's distant. Even this scene with Olga is showing that she doesn't really have her own friends. She still defines herself through the friends that she made through her husband in the super community, because so much of her identity was just tied to Omni-Man. Like, imagine if Superman turned evil, then what is that aftermath like for Lois Lane. 
Oh, and on this card that Olga gives Debbie, we can actually see SOS written in Morse code. Next, we can see Mark catch back up with Adam Eve. Now, Eve and Mark grew close in the first season, and she played a pivotal role in Mark going down the path of the hero. Mark and Eve talk on the rooftop of their school, which reminded me a lot of Peter Parker and MJ in the MCU. Can we just like stay up here all day? When Immortal is brought in as the new leader of the new Guardians of the Globe, we get this great scene with Rex Blow that reminded me so much of Deadpool. Nice entrance. Was he waiting for his cue? Woo! Superhero landing. Yeah, that's really hard on your knees. Now, when we meet the new member of the team, Bulletproof, we can see he's wearing the same costume that was originally offered to Invincible in episode one of season one. What do you think? Well, I don't know about the orange and yellow. Now, it's fitting because in the comics, we actually see Bulletproof, aka Zandel Randolph, take on the mantle of Invincible. So, this episode's overall theme is about the choices we make and what we're willing to sacrifice to become the person we want to be. And, as we discussed in this video here, the multiverse is a great storytelling tool to convey the significance of choice and the past that our choices can set us down. We see this in Mark with Angstrom's revelation that in most universes, Invincible joins his father. In most other dimensions, they teamed up and took over the planet. But in this universe, our Mark strives to remain the hero and make the hard choice to not become like his dad. This theme is continued with Angstrom. He claims to want to help people and doesn't support violence. Look, I'm a pacifist. I don't hurt people. I don't kill people. Working with the two of you is a real ethical and moral stretch for me, but I don't have a choice. Now, while Angstrom claims to be doing the noble thing, he's actively made the choice to allow a universe to exist where the Maulers are in control. Help me do this and I'll give you any single dimension you want. He also has a bit of a god complex. And I can be the conduit of that knowledge. A Prometheus who raises the bar for everyone by sharing what works. But you could argue that in the grand calculus of the multiverse, Angstrom's plan to help billions, if not trillions of people throughout the multiverse is heroic. But at what cost? This is what makes villains like Angstrom and Kang so interesting. Now, speaking of Kang, we've got some references to the time traveler in this scene when Angstrom takes his seat on the mind merging machine. This chair reminded us of Kang's infamous throne and the helmet looks like Kang's helmet from the comics. So as the mind merging begins, we see Cecil finally allow Invincible to rejoin the team. Someone get this kid an earpiece. Now, Invincible is sent to the warehouse where the Maulers and Angstrom are performing the multiversal mind merge. Angstrom tries to reason with Invincible. Wait! Invincible, you don't understand! Angstrom isn't the hero he claims to be or even aspires to be. This fact is amplified when he says to Invincible, This is for the greater good! Yeah? I've heard that before. Invincible is, of course, referring to his father's claim that he and the Viltrumites' planet conquering was for the greater good. But we can help them. We can stop wars, eliminate hunger. Now, Angstrom, like Kang, is a liar, and he's been using the Maulers over multiple universes to achieve the merging of his variant minds. You were using other us's? You said we were special. So, let's break down these other Maulers. Here we have a female Maul, which could be a nod to She-Hulk. And this one looks like Zangief from Street Fighter. This one is wearing a mask that kind of looks like a breathing apparatus, and he's also wearing boots. So, maybe he comes from a universe that has a really rough climate. This one is very disfigured, likely because the cloning process did not go as planned. This one has a robot arm and a robotic eye, a reference to Cable. And by the way, this one also has a robot arm, meaning that one of these clones was created with a missing arm so they could maintain anonymity as to which of them was the clone. This one looks like Kingpin, and this one's head armor also looks like Kang's. So, before the mind merging began, the Maulers warned Angstrom, Once we start the process, it's impossible to stop. But as multiversal Maulers are beating Invincible to death, we see Angstrom remove the helmet to stop the Maulers because he refuses to have a utopia built on blood. I won't build my utopia with blood. Now this is a reference to this line from Avengers Endgame. A grateful universe, born out of blood. When the mind merging machine explodes, we see all the Maulers and Angstrom variants get vaporized, leaving Invincible feeling guilty. But then Cecil chimes in with, This is what happens when you follow my orders. We did good today, do you understand me? Cecil's insistence that these deaths were okay is yet another justification of bloodshed in favor of the greater good, just like Nolan and just like Angstrom. Now this scene between Invincible and Immortal parallels the beginning of the episode where we see variants of the two fighting in another reality. Cecil thinks you're on our side. I'm not so sure. Immortal still does not trust Invincible, and I mean, you can't really blame him. 
Now back to the side of the explosion and we see that one of the Maulers and Angstroms has survived. But Angstrom is no longer himself. He has become every version of himself that was connected to the machine. And like he said earlier in the episode, in most universes, Invincible is evil. So now his many variants hatred of Invincible combined with the destruction of his machine has Angstrom set on revenge. And we finally get to the title card for this episode, which had been teased all throughout. Forget, I'm invincible. They could really use invincible. When was the last time you went out as invincible? He's definitely not invincible. I guess he really is invincible. I won't rest until I get <laughs> So those are all the Easter eggs we found in the season two premiere of Invincible. And I want to shout out the writer of this video, Mr. Colton Ogburn. If you guys found any Easter eggs or thoughts, let us know in the comments below, or you can add either of us on the social media links we've provided. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.